The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is the last vestige of a herd of three and a half to four million bison that once lived here for thousands of years. Even if you can get a person with a disability up in a blind, it's going to be almost impossible for them to move around. CWD is, poses a significant risk to one of the most treasured natural resources of our state. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This is the last vestige of a herd of three and a half to four million bison that once lived here for thousands of years. It is a part of Texas history that must not be lost. My name is Wyman Menzer, and I'm a professional photographer. You know, every time I drive into this country, it, I'm, I'm reminded of the, some of the words from the old Buffalo Hunters and Pioneers journals about the, uh, the wildlife that existed here, the bison especially. Literally millions of them. I actually saw the old film that was uh, released in 1916. It was an opportunity to see the way that the, the Native Americans hunted. It was just a glimpse into the past that we will never see again. These are Southern Plains bison that for thousands of years have roamed this area. My name is Donald Beard. I'm the park superintendent here at Caprock Canyon State Park. It's almost 14,000 acres of some of the most rugged, beautiful canyon lands in the state of Texas. The light just does amazing things in here. We're the home of the official state of Texas bison herd. These bison have unique genetic markers not found in any other bison in the world. They are an important, crucially, vitally important part of the conservation of the species of bison. The Great Kill occurred really in 1877 when they said like over a million bison were killed in Texas. Each buffalo hunter killing uh, hundreds of buffalo in a matter of days. It was here on the J.A. Ranch in the late 1870s when, when Charles Goodnight and his wife Mary established the, the buffalo herd that is today is on Caprock Canyon State Park. She saw the slaughter occurring, felt for the bison, saw the little calves, and just decided, you know, I'm gonna save some of them. Jay Wright Moore, when he talked about coming up in this region and, the, and, and just seeing a herd of buffalo, you know, uh, 10 miles deep and 110 miles wide. And it's just, it just, it just amazes me to think that this country could could support that many, that many creatures. We're in the process of performing our annual gathering and working of the Texas State Bison Herd. 
we do is we administer vaccines to safeguard against various diseases. All right, she needs blood work. We perform pregnancy checks on the females, do an overall health check of all the animals. Just make sure everybody's good and healthy and just, just general health check, make sure it's all good. These are just amazing creatures. And when you're down on the ground with them and you're up close with them, you really get a sense of how massive they are. You have to kind of pinch yourself every now and then so you don't take it for granted. There's a buffalo down there. So our goal is to expand their territory here in the park from about 300 acres into approximately 1,000 acres of native grass restored prairie land. What we have done is we've allowed the animals to come into their new pasture. We are restoring an indigenous wildlife to its native habitat. The genetic pool of Southern Plains bison will roam the old trails of the millions before them. And I'm very thankful for that. This is its, its, its historic home, is we're fulfilling Marianne Goodnight's vision. With the dust, with the light, even though I'm viewing a herd of 75 or 80 through a lens, I'm thinking of 10,000. Because of the long-term view of people like Charles Goodnight and Mary Ann Goodnight, the J.A. Ranch, Texas Parks and Wildlife, we still have these wonderful beasts among us. That one, that one, this is so exciting just to see this just to picture what it was like long, long ago. We have tried to look at every aspect possible as far as the safety of both the animals and the visitors. When you come in the park, you are in the habitat with the bison. They are wild animals. They can run 35 miles an hour faster than a horse. We have designed this fence it's as strong as it can be and still maintain that free-ranging appearance where they're not behind a, an exhibit. I think our biggest key is going to be visitor education. We have to let these people know that when they come in here, these are wild animals, that they need to keep their distance and keep safe. Eventually, we hope to have the herd roaming just the entire park itself. These magnificent animals, the Texas State Bison Herd, the last remnants of the great Southern Plain Bison, these animals belong to the state of Texas. They're your animals. It's a great opportunity to come view the last of their kind as we try to do our best to expand their range and grow the herd. If you would like to see more photos of the Texas State Bison Herd, look for Wyman Menzer's book, Southern Plains Bison, Resurrection of the Lost Texas Herd. Elias Brown is going on his first hunt. He and his dad are in a special hunting blind adapted for people with disabilities. Like most hunts, there's a lot of watching and waiting. But there's space for people with special needs to move comfortably. My son has a prosthetic leg, so it's more accessible to get into it. Even if you can get a person with a disability up in a blind, a traditional blind, it's gonna be almost impossible for him to move around. So these things are eight foot by eight foot with plenty of head space. They're taking part in a first-of-its-kind hunt at Inks Lake State Park, northwest of Austin. The park has built four of these accessible blinds in a hunting area away from the campgrounds. We have done some research and uh, custom built four hunting blinds, full eight by eight. It looks comfortable. It looks Is it better. comfortable? Yeah. We have dropped the windows down to access the height and level of the wheelchair. The carpet is not skid surface, very good noise dampener. The hunt's been great. I got in a wheelchair because a truck driver hit me when I was 18 years old. When I was in the stand, I actually moved around and kind of, you know, shifted my position some. The stand didn't creak or anything, it was just perfectly solid. 
The stands were fantastic, and uh, the, the help here was fantastic. I can't say anything bad about anything. Just think, next time we have lasagna. For Elias, the wait paid off as he bagged his very first deer. He was extremely excited. I said, you'll remember so, this for the rest of your life. That's what happened. As hunters exchanged stories, park staff and volunteers helped process the deer. Were you shaking? No. Oh, yeah. It was my first hunting trip for shot, and he dropped, so that was great. Okay, I'll go 111. And it's really important for me to have a good relationship with him. But yeah, we're really close. Texas Parks and Wildlife offers a wide variety of public hunting opportunities. Inks Lake State Park is already planning the next mentored hunt for people with disabilities. With the increased popularity, the success of this year already, don't know exact numbers, but uh, I can assure you we're, we're going to start constructing a few more. Maybe next year Elias can show his sister the ropes. I have a daughter in a wheelchair and she could easily get there with me and her brother or her mom. Good job, buddy. It just opens up worlds. T-Star Ranch home. This is the most beautiful time of year out here with the green grass, gorgeous blue bonnets. It's been a good year for rain. We typically average 39 inches and last year we got 74 and a half. Walking the ranch you can see what Bruce has been working on since he inherited the land 15 years ago. In about 2001 or two, this was totally covered in mesquite and it was being eaten down to about like a billiard table. We made a commitment to improve the land, try to get it back to its natural state, see if we could interest our sons in that and our grandkids and they have jumped on board so we jumped on board. I wanted to go home. I, I know nothing about the land. I was raised in Dallas. No, I had to learn to really enjoy this area, to be free of smoke and fumes and all of the good stuff that you have in a big city. <laughs> I think if you leave them in another four or five days to get this ryegrass knocked down a little bit more, we developed a plan and we slowly started working together to clear the brush mechanically and leave patches of mots for brush for the wildlife and reseed it with native grasses and to put in cross fencing so that the cows can be rotated and it's, it's really started to turn around. <laughs> Come on, girl. See the umbilical cord hanging down? He's probably uh, two days old, day old. To watch the progression hey boy. of going from city boy, if you will, to country boy having to deal with birthing of calves. You know, like today, we're going to try to help some sick bull. We're going to give him an injection of penicillin. But to see the learning process and the growing process that he's gone through, it's been fun to watch. <laughs> You're going to get popular in a hurry. You stay ahead of him. And, I, you know, I'm stepping right into his boots and the fact that I'm coming from the urban life, and he kind of shows me what's going on with the cattle. There you go. Here we go. While Bruce and David check the cows. Yes, we come out here almost every day. Come on, Patey. Come on, Patey. Shirley stretches the dog. Everybody needs a drink. <laughs> From the time you come in the gate, they're gone. Good babies, good babies, good babies. <laughs> Truly, 
one of the things I enjoy the most out here is when I have family come out and I, I see the excitement in the young kids, my grandkids, I see the excitement in my sons, and that's what I get off of. And now I just like to enjoy the beauty and share it with friends. Hunting is a way of life. If nothing else, it's you know uh, a common interest, a commonality. There, you know, I mean, it's just it's ingrained. I can remember we'd go spend the night at the camp house and wake up in the morning, and all the parents would be gone and out in the deer stands, and evenings we'd be out there with them. I hope our kids take their kids hunting, who take their kids hunting. My grandpa said, "If you find a job you like, you'll never work again." Being able to work with animals and help manage them and conserve them just perpetuates that feeling. Hopefully I am able to hold on to those little tidbits that are our heritage. In 2015, the sky fell out. Uh, they found a positive in a deer breeding facility. With deer in particular, right now we're worried about chronic wasting disease. There is no treatment or cure. Um, the only real management technique we have is containment. Most of our reaction at that time was just wanting for it to not be true. We have an online web portal called TWIMS, the Texas Wildlife Information Management Service. It's the central database that we use to manage deer breeding in Texas. We wound up disabling the TWIMS website to prevent any additional release of deer. All deer breeders were kind of on hold. They couldn't transfer deer for um, a while while we worked on making modifications. I mean, we were affecting people's livelihoods, shutting them down at that point. It's only the type of thing that you do if things are really bad. Our job is to nip it at the bud and find it like a cancer, wall it off and, you know, not let it spread out. We were essentially given a deadline that said, look, we've got to get deer breeders moving again. We've got to get commerce going again by deer hunting season. I think it was 57 days. Mike's very proactive and, and has looked at all aspects of how we use twins and always attempts to identify areas where we could have some improvements. And one of those areas that he identified was that we need a tool to look at essentially how do facilities communicate with one another. We built in a whole messaging kind of system for the deer breeders to try to help them accept or decline a transfer. That became all consuming. The programmers would fix code at night and then we'd come back in the next morning, we'd test again, and we just had a cycle going day after day after day. Without their effort, the whole project would have been set up to fail. As a team, I think we had a bunch of different skills that came together and helped us get the project done on time. Hopefully we've discovered CWD early enough that we might even be able to potentially eradicate it still at this point, that this is not something that we'll have to worry about in the future. CWD is, poses a significant risk to one of the most treasured natural resources of our state. Our program is helping to mitigate that risk. Some of the best people in the agency are on this project, and so uh, it's an honor to be named amongst them. Protecting the way of life, protecting the enjoyment of it, the biggest relaxations I get is, is to be able to come out here and hunt. That is why we do what we do, is in the name of protecting that heritage. Texas, there's a park that's still a secret. Hidden right on the water is Lake Bob Sandlin State Park. Y'all look right here, you can see the red-eared slider out there on that stump. One of the things that we promote about our park is a great place to get away from the hustle and bustle. We're a two-hour drive from the Dallas Metroplex, uh, but once you arrive, you'll feel like you're a million miles away. 
We feel like we're out in the middle of nowhere. We can have room for the tents and, and the camper and just walk right down. <laughs> Beautiful day for a walk. In the morning, the park offers guided hikes that take folks along the lake's edge and into the forest. It's a short walk, will give us a good example of most of the things you will see in East Texas in the Piney Wood. This is a Louisiana milk snake. That's just beautiful. This is the mimic snake of the coral snake. Mm -hmm. And the saying goes, red on black, friend of Jack, red on yellow, kill a fellow. It's a pretty little snake, real common snake for this area. We've got four and a half miles of trails through here. We just saw a small part of it on our walk. We have a stock pond inside the park. It's heavy. No, oh, see, so you're getting a bite. Look at it. It's about a two acre pond, very shaded. Oh, you got him. Roll it, roll it. There you go, I think you got him. Yeah. What's good thing about the pond here is uh, it's got a lot of small fish in it. I got one fish. And uh, young children are guaranteed success, which helps because their patience is not as long. Push him off, put him, let him go. There you go. Now, if parents take the time and keep baiting the hooks, they're guaranteed to get fish before the third. There he goes. Good job. If you're looking for bigger fish, the best bet is out on the water. Just about anywhere you fish could be good. There's almost a, not a bad looking spot on the lake. A place that doesn't look like it'll hold a bass or two. Fish out. Yippee! <laughs> Boy, they sure do shine. Hey, Kelly, go. Did it come off or still on there? It's still on there. Oh, that's a decent one there. Oh, it's. Oh, it came off, Kelly. No, that's called a quick release. <laughs> so, whether it's the fishing, hiking, or lounging, check out Lake Bob Sandlin State Park. Just keep it a secret. Peaceful, it's nice, it's just a great place to be. Hi, I'm Andy Glusenkamp, state herpetologist for Texas Parks and Wildlife, and today I'm going to talk about turtles and roads. This is a young common snapping turtle. He's probably about five years old. This species can reach up to 45 pounds. That seems really large until you compare it to our other native snapping turtle. The threatened alligator snapping turtle can reach almost four times that size. So, what should you do if you find a turtle in the road? My advice is, if conditions allow and it's safe to do so, move the turtle in the direction it was going, but don't do anything that would put you or the turtle at risk. Texas has incredible diversity of freshwater turtles, from red-eared sliders to soft shells to the diamondback terrapin. You may find female turtles crossing the road, either going to or coming from laying eggs. Or later in the season, you may find hatchlings crossing the road, returning to water. So I hope I've helped answer that question of, why did the turtle cross the road?
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.